Today, I'm going to be talking to you about the story of London's underbelly, its sewers. And I'm going to shed some light on the topic ahead of your planned site visit. But let's learn first about the man behind the Crustless Pumping Station and the mind behind the London sewers, Sir Joseph Bazalgette. You may have heard of him. He's a famous civil engineer who embodies the very spirit of the profession. That is, solving the problems of the time. He built London's first sewer network, which consisted of 1,300 miles of sewer and 82 miles west to east of intersecting sewers. This includes the Abbey Mill pumping station at Stratford, the Western pumping station at Pimplow, the Deptford pumping station, the Southern Outfall pumping station, but also the Crossness, as you're aware of. But as part of his work to enhance drainage, Sir Basil Jett embarked, embanked the River Thames in central London. These are the Albert, the Victoria and the Chelsea embankments. And these were claimed 52 acres of land. And that tidied up the river edge, that improved road traffic, and that created more land for buildings. But most importantly, his work helped wipe out cholera in the capital. But we'll get to this much later. You might not expect this, but Basil Jett actually started his career as a railway engineer. But in that time, he managed to hone the skills of land drainage, which would actually facilitate him in coming up with the fluid dynamics required for the London sewer system. When he then became the chief engineer on the London Metropolitan Board of Works in 1852. So, so Joseph Bazalgette was also the 24th president of the Institution of Civil Engineers, and he was knighted in 1872, no, correction, 1874 for his contributions. But let's learn about the need for change and the motivation behind the huge undertaking that was the London sewers. In the 18th century, before Basil Jett began his work on the sewers, London was a very different place. It actually had hygiene measures that would be absolutely deplorable for us in the modern day. At the time, people would use outhouses, and these were known as privies. This is basically where they would have an outdoor toilet, normally in the back of their house or in their garden, and they would use the toilet there. And this would then drain into a cesspit. And the cesspit was an underground, holding tank of liquid waste and sewage. So very pleasant, yeah. <laughs> so, however, gross to us, but actually let's transport ourselves 150 years ago, cesspits were the norm. We had 200,000 cesspits like this spread across London. And of course, the bigger houses, the very established wealthy people would have had their own cesspits. But even the average person, they would have used a cesspit shared by hundreds of people hundreds of households and these cesspits were brick chambers of around six feet deep and four feet wide and they had no flow. Is anyone here? Can anyone hear? Can anyone see the picture? We can't. You can't see the picture? Everything is frozen. It's your end then Michael. We have pictures. <laughs> oh. I have a picture. Sorry I have... I... No no worries. Can everyone see and hear me? We're not frozen. Yeah. We're okay. okay. So I'll Sorry. just go back to the cesspits and I'll just yeah. describe what they are. So these are the brick chambers that would have hold, held everyone's liquid and solid waste. <laughs> and these were huge, but they had no way for the waste to flow. And as you can imagine, a holding tank brimming with human waste and excrement would just pack a punch in the smell department. Basically, it would have unleashed an unholy stench across the London. But the human waste would just sit back in the cesspit until someone like the men in the picture on my slide would come along to remove the night soil as a polite euphemism was at the time. And the night soil being the euphemism for solid human waste. And this could only be transported at night due to the smell. And this was actually a legal requirement. That's why it was deemed night soil because it was so gross and smelly. The law of the day stated that you could only transport at night. And that's why it became known as night soil. So these men would transport the waste from the cesspits to the urban areas, from our urban areas to rural areas, where they would often be used as fertilizers. In fact, areas known as Dung Wharf is normally, historically, where those sewage would have been collected for the city market gardens. So when you're going around London and you're really interested in why these places have these interesting names, is because this is where human waste would have been sold for other uses. <laughs> primarily agricultural use. But in the image on the slide, you can see the Nartsaw men performing this essential task in mucking away the waste in the days before modern plumbing. The men would work in teams of four. 
One man would be tasking crawling into the cesspit and he would then put it in a bucket and the other person, the ropeman, would then pull the bucket out from the cesspit and the two men, as you can see in the picture, would then take the bucket and they would put the bucket in the car. So being a night swordman was a very important job, but it wasn't a very well paid job. And I always wonder when I look at these pictures, how they decided who did what unpleasant job. I don't know about you, I wouldn't be the, want to be the gentleman going right into the cesspit. What pictures? <laughs> now, that all sounds rather bad, right? However, it gets a lot worse. The development of the flushing toilet in people's homes exacerbated the situation. You see the flushing toilet cloth, the flushing toilet was actually patented by Alexander Cummings in 1775. And this meant for every flush, you would get human waste, but also a huge volume of water. This meant that the cesspits were filling up faster than the night men could keep up with it. The cesspits started to overflow, causing human waste to start spreading into the streets and eventually the Thames turning into a stinking open sewer. This, this inefficient system contributed the outbreaks of cholera and other diseases. By the 1850, there were 2.5 people, 2.5 million people living in London. That meant 2.5 million people flushing their toilet waste into the city storm sewers every day. From there, it would flow straight to the River Thames which had transformed into a putrid, festering mess of human waste. You might wonder, why was this causing disease though? Well, the River Thames was the source of London's drinking water. So that meant waterborne diseases such as cholera were spreading easily. And in 1853, a cholera epidemic killed 15,000 Londoners. In short, urgent action was needed. Despite this, and much discussion, nothing was done. In 1840, the construction started on the brand new Houses of Parliament following the disastrous fire which had destroyed the old palace of Westminster in 1834. This lavish new building was initially estimated to cost 700,000, but it ended up costing three times as much. By the summer of 1585, the building was almost complete and the money spent. Now, this queues, June 1858. Let me set the scene. It was an exceptionally hot summer, but you also had a very effluent filled River Thames. These two conditions <laughs> led to the event famously known as the Great Stink. The smell was so bad it reached Parliament. And though the politicians of the day had lime chloride soaked curtains to mitigate the smell, as at the time, they wrongly believed that cholera was spread through the air in a miasma or the smell. They tried to do all they could in these curtains, but they still continued to worry about their health. And then this personal concern <laughs> led them to then commission a new sewage system that would channel away all the waste from central London to the sea. Shortly after this, 18 days later, in fact, there was a bill that became law that provided the money for a complete new sewage system for London. By the 2nd of August, they approved an act of parliament for the expenditure of 2.5 million, around 300 million in today's money. Joseph Bazalgette, who had just started as the chief engineer of the London Metropolitan Board of Works, was put in charge of this project. Bazalgette began in designing London's sewer system as a solution to the city's health problem. His plan was to build an extensive underground sewer system that would divert London's waste downstream to the Thames estuary away from the main area where the people lived. There was history to Bazalgette's design as he used the painter's John Martin's initial idea, which Mr. Martin had developed to preserve the sewage for agriculture use. Bazalgette's design was 1,100 miles of drains that fed into 82 miles of brick-lined sewers to carry the effluent to six intersecting sewers. This replaced the use of open sewers, resulting in cleaning up the Thames and a drop in deaths associated with cholera. It also reduced the number of typhus and typhoid epidemics in the city. Prior to the construction of Bazalgette sewers, London had yet to see an infrastructure project of this scale and cost before. Bazalgette had to adopt clever solutions throughout his construction. 
One of this was the use of the first tunnel boring machine that was developed by Mark Brunel. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Brunel name, but Mark Brunel was the son of the famous civil engineer Isambard Kinder Brunel. The machine had cut heads that exert force and they would cut the rock and then scoop the waste behind them. So by exerting the stress on the rock, it would actually cause the rock to fracture and it would move away the waste, essentially boring the tunnel. These machines were now, these machines were first used on, on London's sewer system. However, these machines are used everywhere in the world today, though they are slightly more advanced than the original designs. These machines are even used on Tideway, which we'll talk about later on today. I actually, on the Tideway site, saw them putting down the 850 tonne TBM, apt aptly named Maleficent Fawcett, after one of the supper jets. But another one of the innovations Basil Jet used was Portland Cement. Now, Portland Cement hasn't been used at that time on any major infrastructure projects. And Portland Cement's benefit is that it was a much stronger cement. And by using this to build his sewers, he actually ensured their longevity. One of the other great material components of Portland cement is that it hardens when it reacts with water. So actually it lasts longer over time as a result of this. And that's actually one of the primary reasons, as well as the really good design, that his sewers are in still such a great working order in the 21st century. Also, Basil Jet needed to make sure that his sewers didn't simply flow back into London on the incoming tide. His solution was to build these embankments that we see today on both sides of the Thames. And these embankments would narrow down the river and they would strengthen the flow, forcing all the sewage far out into the safety of the sea. Basil Jet spent nine years digging up London to create these six interceptor sewers, which was around, which were around 100 miles altogether, and another 450 miles of the sewer fed into them. Some of London's lost rivers were used for the network. This included the River Fleet, running under Fleet Street towards Covent Garden. Building the interceptor system took 318 million bricks to create the underground system. And he dug up more than 2.5 million cubic meters of earth and used 670,000 meter cubes of concrete. Huge amounts of construction materials. Whilst he was planning the system, Basil Jet used the densest population in the capital and he gave everyone a general, a really generous allowance of sewage production. And then using that, he came up with the diameter of the pipe that was required. He then said to himself, we're only going to do this once and there's always the unforeseen. So he doubled the diameter of the pipe that he built. This foresight allowed him to design for a future population of London, such as that came with the introduction of the tower blocks, because there was a surge in London's population and the introduction of the tower blocks and people moving from rural areas to the urban area in London. And this saw, this saw the population absolutely skyrocket. But Basil Jet's allowance and doubling of his pipe diameter accounted for this. If he had used a smaller pipe diameter, the city sewers would have actually overflown in the 1960s and they coped to the 21st century. In total, he and his team built 82 miles of intercepting sewers, parallel to the River Thames, 1,100 miles of sprint sewers at the cost of 4.2 million. Work started on this ambitious enterprise in 1859, and this was virtually complete by 1868, a major achievement for his time. Basil Jett drove himself to the limit in realizing his dream. And his job was made harder by actually working alongside other developments, the underground railway system and the emerging above ground railway system. But Basil Jett had to contend with many challenges when it came to coming up and developing his pioneering new solution. For example, looking at my slide, you see a Victorian lamp and you probably think, what's that got to do with anything? Well, it might look like an ordinary lamp, but a lot of these lamps that you see along London actually have been burning for a long time. Some of them are burned constantly for 120 years. And the reason for this eternal flame was because Basil just sewers, they sometimes misfired, or more accurately put, they backfired. And although the sewer, it swept away the deritis, it didn't get rid of everything. 
and methane gas released by the rotting excrement left behind would build up to dangerous level, exploding out of the sewers and even claiming lives. So Bazalgette's solution was to vent the sewers. But then this released the really unpleasant smell of methane. The answer was this lamp, which would burn the methane vented up from the sewers. And these safety lamps were erected all across London. They provided street lamping, they provided street lighting, but more importantly, they prevented dangerous sewer explosions. Today, a few of them remain and they still burn methane from London sewers. Actually, one that's really easy to go see if you're out in London is if you go to the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, right next to them, behind it, they have one of these lamps. And you can go see, it has a plaque next to it explaining all about it. I last visited it in summer and it's still in great working order. So if you're out in London, I would most encourage a visit. But one of the pumping stations that makes up Bazalgette system is the Cross Nest pumping station, the one you're most interested in. It's now a grade one listed building and it features spectacular ornamental Victorian cast ironwork. And it's actually some of the best example of that in the world today. It was actually designed with Bazalgette, but also Charles Henry Driver. And it was designed at the eastern end of the sewer system. It's actually was previously called the Southern Outhaul Sewers, but over time it's known as the Crustess Pumping Station. During operation, you would have heard and felt the vibrations of the beam, lifting rods, flywheels in operation, and they would have raised the incoming liquid, liquid, <laughs> 12 meters up in the air, all through the power of steam powered pump. The liquid was then pumped into a reservoir and released into the Thames at the ebbing tide, disposing of the raw sewage into the river seawards. At a later date, though, the Royal Commission enforced the separation of solid and liquid waste, with only liquid waste being allowed to pass and solid having to be dumped by boat further out. This was done until 1880, when the chemical engineer, William Webster, developed the system for the electric, electric, electrolytic, pardon me, electrolytic purification of sewage, which trialed, which was first trialed at the Crossmess pumping station. As a result, most of the pumping capacity was eventually designed out. First of all, the steam pumps were replaced with diesel, and then more pumps were added to allow that diesel to work and to meet the capacity of London's growing population. However, when the diesel, the diesel was, the diesel was later replaced, and now, in the late 19th century, following the need to preserve this beautiful pumping station and the ornamental work, work was done to restore it. So that meant a lot of the steam engines that had been decommissioned were now being put back into working order. And if you visit, when you do visit the Crossroads pumping station, you will see that the four original pumping engines are still there, though the original boiler hasn't survived. But You've also seen the Crossless Pumping Station across your TVs. You've seen it in Sherlock Holmes or Michael Faber's The Crimson Petal and the White. It's a beautiful location that's often seen in movies and TV around the world. And when you visit, you'll get to embrace just how beautiful a site it is. And I'm sure you'll really enjoy it. But Bazaljet also designed other pumping stations, as you can see on my slides. Bazaljet's sewer system included intercepting sewers north and south of the Thames, and they were diverting flow away from the town and into the, into the sea. And all of this required areas where the flow could be pumped up at a height to help push it further to sea. And there you have the Abbey pumping station on the left, the Deptford pumping station in the middle, and the Western pumping station at Pimplet. The, Pe the Deptford pumping station was built in 1865, and it's the Easter Deptford, and it's still used today, and it's operated by Thames Water, and it's located on the western side of Norman Road, southwest of Greenwich, to the eastern bank of Deptford Creek, to the south of the confluence with the River Thames. Now, we also have the Abbey Mill and the Northern Outflow System, and all of these are major gravity sewers, which use gravity and pumps to draw the waste further out to sea. Now, you may think Basil Jet's greatest contribution was the sewers. But Bazalgette did more than just build the sewer system that cured London of the disease of cholera. 
He also designed the embankments that we spoke about, and he also built the rivers that crossed the rivers. He laid out the parks, new roads. In other words, he made London the city it is today. Looking left to right, we see the Albert Bridge, which is a road bridge over the tideway, over the tideway of the River Thames connecting Chelsea in central London to the north side of Battersby in the south. And you have the Battersby Bridge, which is an arch bridge made of cast iron girders connecting the River Thames and London. And you have the Putney Bridge, which is actually a listed bridge. And you actually have two parish churches on either side. So that's quite a historic piece there. And you have the Hammersmith, Hammersmith Bridge, which is a suspension bridge. So Bazalgette actually took the novelty of designing all these wide ranging types of bridges, all other feats of incredible engineering, but also absolutely defying and defining the skyline in London as we know it. So his job was that of a dream for any civil engineer to absolutely create and shape the whole city. Now, Sir Basil Jett's design used London's natural drainage system of Lost Rivers, as we talked about the fleet, but also the Tyburn. And these were built over time, way before the Victorian times, but he used them to create flow to his new sewers and to the balancing tanks that we talked about at the different pumping stations. However, during severe storms and times of heavy rain, these would overflow into the river tanks. But rather than flooding the rivers and people's homes and the street, Basil Jet designed it so it only happened once or twice a year. But now this actually happens every week. Though Joseph Basil Jet had designed his sewer system with foresight, not just, to, not just to cater for London's current population at the time, which is 2.5 million, but to cater for 4.5 million people. Today, his system caters for 9 million people in London, and it has, it has reached its capacity. As a result of this, though Basil Jet designed his sewers to only spill maybe once or twice a year, the very extreme weather events, we now see it spilling on a weekly basis pumping millions of tons of raw sewage untreated into the River Thames each year. In most of London, the sewer systems are comprised of these combined sewers and they contain water from sinks, from toilets, from washing machine. They contain the fat runoffs from your favorite takeaway and restaurants, they all join the rainwater runoff and they just go straight into our combined sewer systems. But obviously with the growing population in London, and Basil Jet's limited original design, the system is getting overloaded and the combined systems are no longer able to do their job. So the pipe systems that meant you would have had, I don't know, less water going through them. We now have huge volumes of water with everyone having washing machines and dryers and you know, people putting food waste such as fats into the system. So now we have large volumes sloshing around than he had designed it for in the 18th century. So when we experience a small amount of rainfall, a little bit of, you know, that wet stuff outside, the sewer system no longer is able to cope. And when this happens, all the water that would have once had a place to go doesn't. And the vials that are open to release the wastewater actually just take the wastewater and untreated sewage, run off everything, all the water together and put it into the Thames. This is one of the design flaws of combined sewer systems. And actually, because of this, now we have about 50 dumps into the Thames each year on a weekly basis sometimes. Now, there's obviously the very obvious downside to having flushing raw sewage into the Thames, but there are also some unknown side effects of that. For example, the bacteria in sewage can absorb the dissolved oxygen from the water and it kills off the fishes, it kills off the water dwelling plants and the ammonium in your urine is actually poisonous to aquatic life. And if you were unfortunate and you went swimming in the Thames, it actually, you have a really high chance of getting sick. So the solution to all of this was an even bigger sewer. <laughs> so in 2014, work started on the UK's largest ever water infrastructure project, the Thames Tideway Tunnel, a 25 kilometer super sewer under the Thames from the west to the east of London. It was a 4.2 billion pound infrastructure project starting in Acton, which is the west, where it's 30 meters deep, where it falls down to Abbey Mill, 
the pumping station we spoke about, where it's 66 meters deep. This 72 meter wire tunnel will run for the whole of the 75, of the whole of the 25 kilometers. And this would connect to the 34 of the most polluting CSOs. These are the combined sewer systems that we talked about. These pipes that take all the water from your sink, from your bathtub, from your washing machine, from the fats that's draining and from the runoff when it rains. The most polluting CSOs, these 34, would connect to this 25 kilometer pipe from west to east of London. And this would then allow all this waste to be pumped into the pipe and taken away from the Thames where it can be treated at a facility at Abbey Mill. Now, the Tideway project's already full in its commencement, but due to the delays caused by the coronavirus pandemic, slowing down work on site, it's now planned to be fully operational in 2026. This project, when delivered, will deal with the undercapacity in the sewers, and it will mitigate against the overflow issue that actually currently stands at 39 million tons of sewage flowing into the Thames each year. So those 50 overflow scenarios have actually led to 39 million tons of sewage into the Thames, and it will deal with this, it will stop this issue. And that was a major driver for this project, because waste into, going into sewers has actually been controlled by the EU standards and therefore compliance to the EU standards on wastewater and water bodies was the business case of this project. And this project will take away the current issues with the combined sewer systems. It will deal with separating the stormwater runoff, the wastewater and overflow, and that will also help prevent flooding. As part of the super sewer project, you'll also get a new embankment, which is planned to be by the river near Blackfriar Bridge. This will be open to the public and it'll actually be named Basil Jet's Embankment in the honor of the great Sir Joseph Basil Jet. This super sewer is designed to last 120 years. Tideway's own estimate suggests that around 2 million tons of sewage is still likely to be pumped into the Thames each year. So some people have the opinion that at the cost of 4.2 billion, this project, is it cost effective? And there've been many, many controversial opinions about it because this cost of the project, the 4.2 billion I speak about is actually being passed on to the public. So many of you who are Thames Water customers have probably already seen an increase in your bill of an average of 13 pounds. And this is to compensate for the cost of the project. This might increase in future, it's predicted with inflation to be up to 25 pounds on, on, in addition to your normal bill. So, there are varying opinions. Is Tideway a good idea? Well, it's going to stop 30, 39 million tons of sewage going into the Thames each year. And it's going to reduce that to only about 2 million tons of sewage each year. And it's going to clean up our water, reduce the death of aquatic fish and aquatic plants. And it's going to absolutely benefit ecology and biodiversity, as well as the health of people who choose to swim in the Thames, which I wouldn't, I wouldn't choose to do knowing now we know how much sewage goes into the Thames. So how does this project link to the original, original design that is Basil Jetson sewer? Let's talk about that. Though Tideway is aiming to complete in 2023, I, I believe I've just said it's going to be delayed to 2025. It's currently has 24 construction sites in London and these span all across London from the west to the east where the project is. Now, the Bas Basil Jet's own sewers will be connected. They won't be, I guess, superseded and left alone. There will be added capacity to it. So Basil Jet's own sewers will still be in operation, but all that's gonna happen now is that the most polluting, those 34 CSOs will be connected to this big Thames Tideway sewer. And it's going to be the bigger, I mean, the biggest infrastructure project ever undertaken in the UK water industry. It'll be 25 kilometers long, as I've said, but at its widest point, it's going to be bigger than Big Ben's clock face. And it's going to be deeper in some places than Nelson's column. So it's going to be up to 66 meters deep at its deepest. Now, this is a serious piece of engineering. So basically, Tideway is working with the cutting, cutting edge of contractors, and it's using some of the best solutions to make this happen. So one of the ways that they're doing this is not only are they interacting and intercepting the overflowing CSOs and connecting them and funneling them, one of the ways they're doing this is, example, they've got the Frogmore Connection Tunnel, which is a 1.1 kilometer long 
and the Greenwich Connection Tunnel, which is 4.6 kilometers long. And these connecting tunnels, as well as the 25 kilometer ones, will then help connect the existing infrastructure to this new infrastructure. But how's it gonna be done? Well, you've heard about the tunnel boring machine designed by Mark Brunel, isn't by Kingdom Brunel's son. Well, they're using them again on the Tideway project, but this time they're even bigger. <laughs> they're bigger and they're better, and they're improving on previous technology. On the, on the Tideway scheme, they're evacuating the main tunnel plus two other tunnels, the smaller connecting tunnels I just talked about, and these require two construction sites, main tunnel sites, where the TBMs are being launched, received, and then used to drill into the intersecting tunnels and the connecting culverts, which will connect to the existing sewers and the new tunnel. Construction of the SAF of the shafts, the long shafts that go down at the CSO sites will transfer the flow from the existing sewer to the tunnels. And these will vary depending on the depth. The amount of flow that's needed to carry in these shafts, but also the geology, because obviously London has, you know, this London clay that we hear about. So it has to really be designed to work with the geotechnical principles of the soil. The shaft will be a concrete cylinder with internal diameter varying from six to 24 meters. And in some places it's going to be 20 to 60 meters deep. These shafts would allow the space to drop the TBMs. And then these TBMs will then bore making the tunnel, making the massive tunnel and also the intersecting tunnels. Now, they're also using brand new technology. They're using uh, electric hydroface. And this is a rotary trench cutter that actually allows them to drill down to the required depth. And this is the first time it's been used, actually. It's the first time an electric version of this is being used, which means it's not polluting and it's not creating um, unnecessary fumes. And actually, it mitigates having a very, very loud construction site. As the TBM moves forward, the now, it then also pre-cast concrete segments as it goes along. In the past, when a TBM would have worked, as we talked about, in Mark Brunel's one, it would have had the front fracturing the rock and then collecting the rock behind it. But now in Tideway's TBM, as it's fracturing the rock, it's also laying a concrete pre-laid structure, creating the tunnel as it drills along and evacuating the material to be transported out of the tunnel by a conve conveyor belt system and then processed off site. Other common methods are seen on this site, such as coffer dams, which is basically when you create piling so you can take away water in an area so you can reclaim land or have a safe, dry area to do work. And this is gonna be used all through the site just to reclaim the land for the embanked areas that we've talked about. One of the biggest challenges for the tideway schemes, obviously, it's working in a very developed London, with huge infrastructure, and it's drilling underneath it. So it had to be really careful and undertake lots of um, archaeological work as well as geotechnical work to make sure the soil work was done in a way that was appropriate and would cause damage to existing buildings, especially when you're thinking about the fact that we already have underground systems in London and overground railways. But also, it actually has quite a constrained site. London's massively built and overpopulated in some ways. So managing to bring plants and material back and off site in a safe way was one of the challenges. And the project dealt with this by actually using the river a lot. And that actually has been a massive benefit that other projects are adopting because it's actually reduced the number of HDVs, these massive vehicles on our roads, reducing road congestions, but also fumes and actually safety incidents because HDVs have been really linked with a lot of cyclist deaths. And there've been a lot of construction campaigns to reduce their use. So it's actually, this project's actually adopted some of the best elements of sustainable engineering, such as using the river, reducing the amount of vehicles coming to site, as well as working within the constraint site, adopting improved technology, such as the new version of a TBM, using hydrophase, like this electric, reducing carbon output. So the Tideway construction project built on Bazalgette's legacy, but builds using some of the cutting edge, modern engineering construction methods of the day. Also, engineering has always been about sustainability, but this also means social, environmental, and economic sustainability. Now, the primary purpose of the project was obviously to reduce the waste going to the River Thames each year, delivering improved water quality. 
But Tideway also brings environmental and social and economic benefit. Tideway commissioned an independent social return on investment assessment as part of its legacy program. And they actually found that for every one pound spent on the project, they actually had a return of 3.39 pounds delivering value across the environment, health and safety and well-being, the economy, people and places. In addition, the company has mapped its legacy using the UN Sustainable Goals, as on my slide, with the target of adding value to the community, hiring people from incarcerated backgrounds, giving apprentices, using um, the spoil summit site on other projects, transforming, transporting spoils via river Varadhan Road, protecting road users, taking the um, use, um, avoiding 200,000 heavy goods vehicle movements, signing up to the BRE ethical labor sourcing standards, focusing on local employment, employing people with criminal backgrounds, as I've said, giving apprentices, offering work placements, and just generally adding huge value to the community so that people can get huge benefits. But Tideway also aimed to add an environmental legacy more than just improving the biodiversity and the ecology in the river. So Tideway works with volunteers who collect plastic bottles from the Thames. And they, in fact, last year, the year before the pandemic, they collected 96,427 plastic bottles from Thames. All of this is just showing its commitment as another engineering project to the environment, to society and to the economy, which is one of the pillars of engineering and kind of the heart of what Bazalgette was doing, adding social benefit, economic benefit and environmental benefit. So what happens next? The Thames Tideway will one day need to be replaced or have its capacity augmented. Even though this current design is going to stop 39 million tonnes of waste going into the River Thames each year, you're still going to have 2 million tonnes of waste going into the River Thames each year. And as London's population continues to grow, as we have heavier and heavier rainfall due to climate change, there's going to be a need to do something further. And there is general consensus on this in the water resources community that we cannot build larger and deeper sewers. I mean, the Thames Tideway sewers at its greatest depth is 66 meters deep. We cannot build deeper and bigger sewers. It's just too impractical and costly. And obviously there's no way to complete, completely move the cost of this to the public. So there have been some practical suggestions about what we as individuals so not just me as an engineer, but every one of us on this call can do to make a difference. So I'll tell you about this. We can Im implement some small suggestions. This is, for example, not using wet wipes. They say they're flushable, but they're not biodegradable. Because as you can see in my slide, we have a lovely, lovely picture of a fat bug and me with my animated fat bug as well. <laughs> because these fat bugs compromise the ability of, the, of these amazing sewers to do their job. They create blockages in them. And I'll tell you why. Because every time you put waste in it and the fat and oils, it calcifies. And this calcifies creating this huge unmovable structure that basically becomes a barrier in the pipes. But we can play our part by not using these wipes that are flushable but not biodegradable, by not putting anything that isn't, you know, the stuff that should be in your toilet. <laughs> and basically playing our part to only flush toilet paper, poo and pee down our toilet and making sure things like fats and oils don't go down the drain. And in fact, you collect them, put them in a bottle, put them in the bin, or in some Lego councils, they actually collect them. And just playing our part, because looking at the slide and looking at the Whitechapel Fatberg, which is 215 meters long and weighed 13 tons when it was removed, just shows the grand scale of the issue. And we can't continue to build bigger and bigger sewers. We can't continue to put what to keep producing and using water in a reckless way that keeps pumping into our water systems. We can't continue to put stuff that shouldn't be in our toilets in our toilets. Otherwise, we'll keep getting these huge monstrosities clogging up an, an already overburdened sewer system. And the likes of projects like Tideway won't be able to cope with the problem that we're creating. So let's play our part. Let's not flush things that shouldn't be in our toilet. Let's put fat, oil and grease in those bottles and chuck them in the bin or get them collected by the council. Let's play our part 
let's try and reduce our water usage. <laughs> Bless me. Let's, you know, collect water runoff from our gutters and redirect it for the plants in our gardens. Let's unpave our front gardens and, you know, put some grass on there so the water can absorb in so we have less runoff kind of causing huge demands on our sewer systems. Let's play our part. And that's what I'm gonna end with. Let's play our part. And I'm gonna refer you guys to the Renewable Resource Hub, which has some great tools for what you can do at your home or your workplace or wherever that you share a community and how you can take a part to influence and reduce the water being wasted, the bad stuff going to our sewer systems and helping the great engineers at Tideway, but also respecting the legacy of a great engineer like Joseph Bazajek. He did an amazing job building the sewers that we have so much enjoyed and has given us such a good quality of health and hygiene in this country. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Are you going to turn off your sharing? Yes, I am. Oh, yeah. You have ah, right at the back. We're back. Well done, Nio. Well done. <laughs> You, uh, you've certainly got a great enthusiasm for this project, haven't you? And a, and a great mind for um, facts and figures by the looks of it. So thank you very much for sharing all that with us. Um, do you mind if, we, if, if there's any questions? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to answer as many um, questions as I can. If anybody wants either to put their hand up and I'll scan across the screens or to send me a chat message or AO, IO a chat message. Then, um, then Barbara and Graham. Oh, Wilma. Wilma, do you want to ask a question, Wilma? Yes, please. I think the fat deposits are horrendous in the sewers. How on earth do we, play, we persuade restauranters who are guilty of it to stop putting the fat in down the sinks, down the drains? How? Well, one of the things you can do is encourage them to use fat traps. But if you're concerned they're not doing their part, you can work with your local councils. Like councils have environmental officers who go and like, they actually go and review these um, restaurants and see how they're performing. And they can actually issue warnings and improvement notices. And improvement notices are super costly. So for the duration, they don't do the work, they get an escalating bill. So that is a great encouragement for you know, these restaurants to play their part, because if we as individuals are doing our part, then businesses also should join us and help us get the job done. So that's something you can do. Contact your council, they'll get the environmental officers out there and they'll get the problem dealt with. Thank you. No worries. Anyone else? Tony, did you want to ask a question? No, you're muted. Anybody else? Can, yes. I, ask a question? can I ask a question, John? Sure. Can I ask um, about? Oh, she, sorry, sorry. Can, can I ask about the, the cross nest pumping station? It was being restored by volunteers. Is the is the restoration complete now? Yes, it is. When I was actually, I, I filmed a project there last year, and it was absolutely beautiful. It's been restored. The only thing that's missing is the original boiler engine, and I just yeah. think it made it. They couldn't restore. It, I think when when I visited, it was under under I mean, amazing how people know how to restore something as old as that and how to make it work again. Yeah, to dying art. It's one of the things I always say to people um, that there's so many industries like that. And it's something that we also struggle with in engineering. For example, one of the old skills of an engineer working on a construction project is something called steel fixing. And it's, you know, how you build the reinforcement structures that you eventually pour concrete in and they become these superstructures. And I remember my very first project, I think it was, I was a summer engineering student and I was working in Brighton. And is that there is such a, a magical skill to it. It's not just something you can study. You actually have to watch and learn to building, you know, these steel structures. And I remember from this really old but amazing um, guy on site teaching me the art. And sometimes when you're looking at these restoration projects, you almost think, oh my God, they're these amazing talented people. And I hope someone's apprenticing on them and learning the arts because, you know, this, I don't want them to die out. They're brilliant skills. Mm, yes. And all that beautiful brass work. I mean, it's just amazing the how they were built with to be so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, a lot of gorgeous cast ironwork, and there hasn't been that scale of work done 
elsewhere. In fact, if you look at some of the other pumping stations, they don't quite match up to Cross Nest Beauty, um, which is one of the things I'm surprised not many, not many people have tried to steal it or you know, burglarize it <laughs> in its history, considering how beautiful it is. And it doesn't smell. <laughs> just a bit, actually. <laughs> really, oh, just uh, a bit. It's just got a pong in the air, but it's nothing that's unpleasant. You get used to it quite quickly. <laughs> how many boilers? <laughs> that's how one of the boilers? first things I remember going to that site. I was like, it pongs a bit, just a little bit, but I like it. <laughs> how, many, how many boilers that cross nest? I think it has four now. Four. Four boilers. I think how so. Many pumps? Four. So oh, got... I, how, I'll have to check, but I think it has four boilers. I'll have to check. And Let four me pumps. Recollect. Let me think about it. What did I say in my slide? I was testing my memory now. I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> no, don't worry. Don't worry. I'll just, I'll just finish. Um, Pat, you'd like to ask a yes, question? Yes. Uh, what's going to happen? I'm not an engineer, so I don't understand anything of this really, but what's going to happen to the old sewer system um, when, you, when you start the new one? Oh, so we started on the new one. It will be ready by 2023 or worst case 2025 because of the pandemic, but it's connecting to Basiljit sewers. So Basiljit sewers have the CSOs. We don't actually design combined sewers anymore because they get overloaded quite quickly. And all we're doing is connecting with intersecting um, pipes. So like at Frogmoor, which is 1.1 kilometer long, I think, and we're connecting from Basiljit's old CSOs, the worst ones, we have 34 where they overflow the most, and we're going to connect those pipes to the new pipe where it then goes to the main 25 kilometer long one, which is going to pump it to Abbey Mills where it will be treated. So it will mean that we're basically taking the worst spilling pipes that Basiljet designed and we're transporting them mm -hmm. by intersecting pipes mm -hmm. to the main pipe where we can then treat them, if that helps. That so story. you're not getting rid of all of it. No, we're building yeah. it. All we're doing is taking the things that don't work as well and adding more pipes to it so that we can siphon the waste before it goes into the Thames. I see. Yeah, no, we're building on Bazajet's le legacy. We're definitely not yeah. taking yeah. rid of his structure. He designed it so well. All it needs is a little bit more capacity because London has grown past 4.5 million, which is what he designed for, to 9 million and more now. How I'm, surprised, I'm surprised they found room for these massive new sewers. Mm. It can't be that That, that was one of the biggest challenges, actually, and it's one of the challenges in the planning, trying to find a route that didn't clash with anything else in London, because we have a lot of stuff mm. under London. You know, mm. we have the railway systems, or the subways, or whatever you want to call them, um, underground, and these all have to be designed for. But also, because we have London clay, which actually is tough to building, it's not solid enough, a lot of the tall buildings in London, like the Shard and et cetera, they had to be piled super deep for them to work. So the deeper the piling goes to the structure, the more interaction, you know, the pipe that we're building now has with this. So it's actually quite a lot of constraints picking a path for this 25 kilometer long thing. Like how do you pick a path that doesn't interact with anything, doesn't damage anything, that doesn't affect the structural stability of a super skyscraper. Yeah. It blows my mind, the engineering right yeah. there. Mm. That's why oh, I that's called you technical problem. engineers. I call them the dark magicians because they do things that seem very, very impossible and kind of scary. Mm. Mm. Well, very clever. Um, yeah, they're very clever people. Ian. Um, you mentioned the figures for the amount of sewage going to the Thames and the big reduction in that. Yeah. But the other factor about sewage is how concentrated it is, what its biological oxygen demand is. Okay. Have you any indication of how that changes? Because my understanding is that the water going back into the Thames mm -hmm. is very much cleaner and is uh, uh, quite low in BOD. So because we use combined sewers, they combined rainwater, water from your sink, water from your bath, and also sewage together. So because it's not separated, even if there's huge volumes of rainwater in one flow, we're having quite a lot of actual sewage in it. And it's not a way of actually consistently Ooh, knowing how much sewage there is. For example, if we had a bout of massive rain in London where there's very little transpiration, I mean, transpiration mean evaporation of water and everything oh, runs up into the sewage yeah. system, it joins the waste that's already in the CSOs and it then overflows. So there's not really a control factor about how, what, what element of the, the runoff 
is oh. because it's everything combined. That's why we don't use CSOs anymore. We don't combine runoff with wastewater so that we can control them and we can understand, okay, if it's gonna run off, it's clean water. And that wasn't something that was done at the time. Everything was combined. Um, but what we are getting is now the reduction in those overflows, which means that at least we have more control about what's happening. So if you're getting 2 million tons of sewage, it's a lot less than 39 but we can't often control actually the concentration of what it is in the 50 spills we have a year or the weekly spills we have, because we can never know how much rainwater is going to trigger that or how much water is going to be coming from your sink as opposed to your toilet. So this will be an improvement in being able to control that. But also the fact that engineers don't build CSOs anymore is also another amazing factor in making sure we can differentiate between the water types. So the water, the sewage, um, isn't processed over sewage beds, which is the normal treatment of sewage. It's just simply a dilution factor, you're saying? Yes, because it's coming from a combined sewer, so it's never going through a control factor. That's yeah. why it's, it's overflowing. But if it was yeah. going through, it would normally go through the system down to the... Um, the southern outflow where it's then treated and then pumped out but because it's overflowing earlier in the system there is no control or treatment of it it's just what's in the system at that time when the system fails or the system is overloaded it's the more accurate way what, what is the impact of that on the, the north sea i couldn't tell you i just you mean the impact of having more waste on the north sea yeah having this sewage effectively just diluted going into the north sea Oh, I did read a fun article about this a long time ago, that actually um, this, the North Sea actually has a high level of cocaine in it because a lot of Londoners use cocaine and it, it ends up in their feces. And obviously we put people's solid waste out to sea. So actually we're changing and having these chemicals and products that we're consuming out into the sea. So I guess to answer your question by sideways matter is actually we have a lot of toxins and a lot of un... Um, untreated elements in in the sea but because we are preventing those sewers being overloaded now and we're treating them with a the tideway system that will treat everything at abbey mills we can at least remove the worst things and it's only the chemicals that can't be treated by a current processing that will end up in in the sea but yeah mm. there is a lot of funny articles about actually the stuff that slips through the treatment and ends up in the sea perhaps uh, ian can have your email io and uh he can ask these very technical questions. There's so there's so much fun reading on it. So yes, uh, there's, there's so much. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, I'd appreciate Jeff. that. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Ian. Um, with Jeff, do you want to ask a question? I, 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 I believe Basil Jet system runs on gravity. The flow is downhill. Does mm -hmm. will that be the same with Tideway, your new system? Yes. So at the very um, Never east, sorry. From the west to the east, so the west is actually 30 metres deep and at the east it's 66 metres deep and it's going at a 1 in 800 gr um, gradient, so it's actually still using gravity. Right, thank you. Mm. Mm. I'll, uh, any more questions? I'll scan across the screens. Oh, Yvonne, you've got a question, Yvonne? You unmute Yvonne, unmute Yvonne, unmute. We can't hear you. <laughs> Can somebody show how to unmute? No. Uh, um, any, yeah. Yeah, if you look at the bottom of your screen, Yvonne. And it's mine's to the left actually on my screen. Yeah, it's just the left yeah. button if you're using a laptop. That helps. Uh, right. Well, I'll wait for Yvonne to unmute. But okay. any more questions if I scan across? No. No John, more questions. I think Graham Slough's got one for you. Oh, Graham. Thank yeah. you, Graham. I just wanted to ask um, Io about the size of the workforce for Tideway. And that must be huge because it's a mm. massive yeah. construction project. I can't state the number of workers on Tideway at any one time, at any one point, but I can say that we have about 
on time, right? I feel like I've really claimed the project. I've been to the site a couple of times and I'm really excited. Um, but um, 50% of the people on there are apprentices or they come from the local community or they're ex, ex incarcerated. So um, I just want to brag about that social benefit that they're adding as well. But the number of workers on any one point on Tideway, I, I couldn't say from the top of my head. No, I can't. Well, presumably we're talking about thousands, are we? Yes, it'll be a massive workforce, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Have I, have I unmuted? Yes, yes, you have. I have. I have. Go on, Yvonne. <laughs> and do you see a time when sometimes everybody's loo will be engineered that half the work will be done before it leaves the house? Oh, I've actually been really interested in this um, from a cutting edge innovation point of view. And I know that the Green Building Council have been looking at other ways that they can you know, retrofit buildings to allow them to be more efficient. And one of those efficiencies is insulation, it's water usage, and it's looking at the toilet. But being part of those discussions just shows the, the kind of a lot of cost and the constraints to doing that. Who holds the cost of that? Is that central government? Is that local councils? Is that the homeowner that takes the, the job of retrofitting their property to meet what are the new standards that are going to help meet sustainability targets or efficiency targets? And knowing the political elements that are constraining that, I still think it's a lot further in the future than we think. And I think with you know, Tideway just being built in, and being completed in 2025 and having a design life of 120 years, I think we're probably looking about 200 years into the future to look, I think our buildings are <laughs> that efficient where the, you know, the heating's more efficient, yeah, yeah. the water use is efficient okay, and our yeah. toilets are efficient. But I think it's 200 years. I'd say, because there's a lot of political constraints and how the cost is split. So we're a long way away from that, I think. Okay, thank you. No worries, it's exciting. I think you've done a good job, Io, in answering questions. I think, if, could we take one more question and then we'll wrap it up for this evening? Can you hear me, Io? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Tony, have you got a question? Tony Tyshurst? No, okay. Um, We'll take one more question if anybody's got a question. Anybody like to ask a question? Ah, oh, Lance. Lance, would you like to ask your question? You need to unmute, Lance. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Thank you, Ira, very good. Um, obviously, this is all concentrated on London, your speech and your experience. Um, clearly, we have many big cities scattered all over the country, let alone smaller cities. So presumably a very similar uh, catch up is going on in Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield, whatever. Um, and in London and some other cities, obviously there are, there are other big, big rivers. What happens in uh, perhaps places like Sheffield, and I'm, I'm not sure, but you know where they may not have big rivers to, uh, to, to feed the, um, the sewage in and so on? Mm. Lance, that's a really good question, but I've never studied any of the other areas but London. And mm -hmm. I'm a very much a Southern engineer. All my projects have been in the Southeast. Um, so my scope doesn't really expand past that. I don't think I've even worked in a project that's further. <laughs> no, no, I've never worked in a project up North or anything. So right. um, the scope of my experience is limited ge geograph geographically, so I really couldn't advise on that one really, Lance, but okay. I could look into that. Sorry about that, Lance. That's all right. <laughs> well, thank you once again, Io. Anyway. Yeah, I'm very much a Southern engineer. All my projects mm. are in the Southeast. So once again, thank you very much, Io. Um, fascinating talk, and um, you've yes. obviously got a lot of information yeah. And how you remembered all those all those numbers? Yes, indeed. <laughs> Thank Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Um, before we end, uh, Julia, I don't know whether you wanted to say anything more about your next. Um, if Julia is still around.